In 1985, Coca-Cola released New Coke in a move that became the poster child for one of the largest catastrophes in marketing history. They ended production of the Coke taste people loved and replaced it with something they didn't want. Just two years later, Ford nearly followed Coke with a Japanese-engineered front-wheel drive Mustang that didn't even have an all-American V8. Thankfully, wiser heads prevailed, although in a rush to find a new name for the car, Ford did use a pre-approved name that sounded more like some sort of medical device. So why did Ford approve a Mustang replacement customers revolted over, and what did they think of it when it was launched? This is the Ford Probe story. In the 1970s, high fuel prices had sent shockwaves through the car industry. Fuel economy was in vogue, and with interest rising in low-drag cars, Ford charged in-house stylist Don Kopka to produce a concept. A World War II veteran, Don had done the first Mustang restyle in 1967, but had made a name for himself in the 1970s, reducing the drag of existing cars, improving their fuel economy for minimal cost. The result was the Probe 1 concept that used the chassis from the 1979 Ford Mustang and a turbocharged 2.3 litre engine. Ford's design house, Gear, would help with the styling, producing a sleek body with a drag coefficient of just 0.25. Inside, the car was luxuriously bedecked in tan and fire engine red, and for some reason had a comically large automatic gear shifter. Ford must have been happy with Don Kopka's creation as they promoted him to vice president in 1980. They also ordered a second probe concept, this time a five-door hatchback that looked much closer to something that would be seen on the road. But Ford pitched this car not as a hypermiling wonder, but as a car steeped with safety features. The next probe concept wouldn't come from Detroit, but from Ford of Europe. If you think the car looks familiar, it's because it was a warm-up act for the 1982 Ford Sierra and signalled the dramatic styling shift Ford was about to make. The motoring press greeted it with warm praise when it was launched at the 1981 Frankfurt Motor Show, and Ford must have taken that as a good sign for the Sierra. How wrong they would be. The new concept was quite a feat. Ford had created a spacious five-door hatchback with the same low drag as the low-slung Probe 1. It achieved this by filling in every nook and cranny to make the car as smooth as possible. The interior was no less radical, both on the drawing board and in reality. The shape of the Probe 3 would not only impact the Sierra, but the upcoming Ford Granada and Scorpio restyle, and to a lesser extent the North American Ford Taurus. It was with this backdrop that Ford started planning its Mustang replacement. Work started in 1982, and it was quickly decided to make the new car front-wheel drive. Many cars were starting to power the front wheels, including GM's next Pontiac Firebird and Chevrolet Camaro, and there were cost and weight savings by going this direction, rather than the Mustang's traditional rear-wheel drive setup. But Ford's work was halted in 1983, when it was decided the new Mustang would be part of a joint development with Mazda. After Mazda needed bailing out in the early 1970s, Ford had bought a minority stake, and by 1983 it had risen to 25%, so there was interest from Ford in reducing costs by working more closely with its new partner. Mazda were producing an update to the 626, and had plans to produce a two-door coupe using the same chassis that would be called the MX-6. Sharing platforms between cars, of course, made economic sense. The 1979 Mustang had used a chassis used by several other cars, and so basing a new Mustang on Mazda 626 platform made sense. And with Mustang sales falling, wouldn't shaking the formula up a bit make sense? By the early 1980s, American-made cars were seen as unreliable, with Japanese cars seen as solid and dependable. It would also allow Ford to compete with Japanese upstarts such as the Toyota Celica, Honda Prelude and Nissan Z cars. In a first, the Mazda 626, MX-6 and the new Mustang would all be built in Ford's backyard. Japanese technology and know-how would all be coming to America's automotive heartland. The Mustang was known for its V8, but with the advent of fuel injection and fuel economy concerns, plus having a smaller engine bay, they decided to go with Mazda's 2.2-litre four-cylinder and Ford's own 3.0-litre V6 that would soon feature on the Taurus and Aerostar minivan. 
This would give the car similar acceleration and top speed to the existing Mustang, but despite smaller engines and fuel injection, the fuel economy was surprisingly not vastly improved. With Mazda working on the mechanicals, Ford turned its attention to the body. This would be designed by Toshi Saito from Ford's North American Design Center, but his first design was rejected by Ford's management as something that would date too quickly. His new design had a low front that Mazda's engineers weren't keen on as it would involve lots of chassis rework, but Ford pushed the design changes through. While work started on the Mustang's new look, Don Kopke's team was working to create new probe concepts. The 1983 Probe 4, again created with the help of Gear in Turin, would be Ford's first car developed on computer. The concept once again used wheel covers and a low slung design to give a stunning 0.15 drag coefficient and to get the most out of the Ford Escort derived 1.6 litre engine. And to give the car such a low front end, the engine was rotated 70 degrees. Active suspension would raise the rear and lower the front at highway speeds, and a movable front spoiler would help fuel economy. But it wasn't a realistic vehicle. The windows wouldn't roll down, the 70 degree tipped engine needed a special casting to make it work, the front suspension had to be cut down which would likely impact the travel, and the car used skinny tyres to reduce rolling resistance but reduce the all important contact patch in case of emergency avoidance manoeuvres. Don and his team challenged themselves to find even more drag efficiency, and the result was the 1984 Probe 5 concept. The new design had a mid-engine layout and innovative doors that opened out, then back as if a futuristic minivan had been caught in a crusher accident. It had back seats, although they didn't look all that spacious, and with it being a concept, they couldn't just sit there and be seats, they apparently rolled up like a set of blinds when not needed. But the team managed to beat the Probe 4 with a drag coefficient of less than 0.14. With this background of dramatically low drag styling, Toshi Saito set out to create a fitting next generation Mustang. With more cars featuring a more practical hatchback design, it was decided to make it a three door hatch, with a small bustle like the 1984 Ford Escort as a nod to those who like the sedan or saloon car aesthetic. US legislation required that a car with such a low front use pop-up headlights, and these would be borrowed from Mazda's RX-7. Through clever use of black minimalist pillars, the roof would seem to float above the cockpit, giving a wall of glass. This was a world apart from cars like the pedestrian Ford Tempo, or even Ford's new big seller, the Ford Taurus. The sleek lower roofline meant rear passengers had very little headroom, but then the existing Mustang didn't exactly give acres of space in the back. This was an amazing design, reminiscent of the Probe concepts, and had a low drag coefficient of just 0.31, but it was a dramatic departure from the existing Mustang. After the new Coke backlash, the old formula had been marketed as Coke Classic, and Ford intended to assuage existing customers by selling the existing Mustang as the Mustang Classic, with the new car being the new Mustang. But Auto Week broke the news of the new car in April 1987 that caused outrage in the loyal Mustang community. The Mustang was an all-American V8 icon, and Ford was trying to palm its customers off with a front-wheel drive Japanese V6 reheat with styling that didn't remind anyone of Mustangs of old. It even had a fuel economy meter. A furious letter-writing campaign ensued and caused a spike in sales of the existing Mustang as customers worried this was their last chance to buy a true Mustang. Dealers also revolted as they saw this as a car that just wouldn't sell. Ford was in a bind. They had a new car that was ready to go, but releasing it was obviously a non-starter. They already had enough two-door coupes, so didn't need another. The answer, of course, because you know the name of this video, was to rename the car as the Ford Probe after the series of design concepts and the fact that this was one of Ford's pre-cleared names for worldwide use. The existing Mustang would stay on dealers' forecourts. The car that lost out in this game of musical coupes was Ford's low-selling Escort EXP that was axed in favour of the Probe. <music> Do 
Just four months after the auto week crisis, the new Ford Probe was shown to dealers and it was launched to customers at the Chicago Auto Show in May the following year. It not only looked much more modern than its sibling, the Mazda MX-6, but it was cheaper too. Customers loved it and soon Ford had received 100,000 pre-orders from dealers. The 120 horsepower 2.2 litre engine was available at launch and the 3 litre V6 arrived the following year. But the fastest was the GT model which turbocharged the smaller engine. This mirrored the Mustang that had offered a 2.3 litre turbocharged engine delivering similar performance. But the Mustang's 5 litre V8 could still best the probe in a drag race. The probe also came with the MX-6's adaptive air suspension or AAS. It was a clever system that changed the ride between three softer or harder settings and it was the forerunner of today's more sophisticated adaptive suspension. Sales of the Probe were respectable and sales of the older Mustang took a dip. But after the first couple of years, Probe sales started to drop off. The 1993 Probe update would be headed by Mimi van der Molen. She'd worked on the 1974 Mustang II as a trainee, but thanks to her pioneering ergonomic work on the interior of the Ford Taurus, she'd become the first female automotive design executive. The new Probe would take advantage of the updated 626 and MX-6 chassis, producing a car that was longer and wider, but surprisingly a little lighter. If it was possible, it also became even curvier with smooth wraparound rear taillights. The 3.0-litre Ford V6 was swapped out for Mazda's 2.5-litre fuel-injected V6, giving a 0-60 time of 7 seconds. The 2.2-litre four-cylinder was swapped out for a smaller 2.0-litre engine that got to 60 in around 10 seconds, but had much better fuel economy than the previous engine. The Probe's Japanese competition intensified, and new competitors such as the Volkswagen Corrado arrived. To make matters worse for the Probe, Ford released an update to the Mustang the following year. The Probe wasn't the new cool kid in town anymore, and despite the new model, demand wasn't great. Sales of affordable cars in the UK had taken a nosedive in the 1980s with the rise of hot hatches, and this had led to the demise of Ford's Capri. There had been a small resurgence in the early 1990s with cars such as the Vauxhall Calibra, and this gave Ford confidence that the probe might do well in Europe. So, in a move to boost sales, Ford started exporting the probe first to Europe and eventually to Japan, Australia and New Zealand. But despite Ford UK hoping to sell 20,000 cars a year, they only sold 15,000 in the first three years, and imports ended in 1997. It seems that despite the nostalgia for a new Capri, the Probe wasn't the car customers wanted. Ironically, if Ford had named the car the Capri, there might have been more demand. And sales weren't faring much better in the US, despite special editions like the Probe SE. The last probe rolled off the production line in 1997. Unlike the outcry for the Mustang 10 years earlier, there wasn't a tear shed for the probe. Like the Capri before it, sales had started out well, but dropped off quickly as this fashionable car was discarded like last year's Haute Couture. That same year, production also ended for the Thunderbird and Cougar. Both of these cars would get a rebirth, and the 1998 Mercury Cougar in America and Ford Cougar in Europe would be a replacement of sorts for the Probe, along with the 1998 Ford Escort ZX2, also based on a Mazda chassis. The Probe was a classic case of thinking of a problem backwards. Ford had a relationship with Mazda, Mazda had a car in the works that was a Mustang-sized sports car, putting a new body on an MX-6 would be a cheap way to get a new car. They didn't think about what the Mustang meant to the faithful who bought them. When creating an update to a car, you need to start with a list of features that a car needs to have to sell. And it's clear that V8, rear-wheel drive and all-American should have been top of the list for the Mustang. With such a futuristic design, it was perhaps not surprising that the Probe appeared in futuristic films like Back to the Future 2, set in 2015. It's perhaps ironic that by 2015, most probes had been sent to the crusher, but there were plenty of retro-styled Mustangs to be found on the road. The Mustang refused to die, and although the mid-90s replacement wasn't the all-conquering car customers hoped it would be, it would improve into the 2000s and keep the Mustang name alive. 
New versions wouldn't focus on dramatic new styles like the Probe, but on design elements that harken back to the original Mustang. Nostalgia sells. Even the new electric Mustang Mach-E, a car that's definitely not replacing the V8 Mustang, but augmenting it, has Mustang design elements to help it sell. Ford, like Coke, has learnt its lesson. They also ordered a second fro probe. No, it's not a probe, it's a probe. And to give the car such a low front end, the car was rotated. The whole car was rotated 70 degrees. Probably not. And Ford intended to us. That's not a word I expected. <laughs> the existing Mustang would stay in dealers' forecourts. In them? Or are they going to bury them? The 1993 Probe update will be headed by Mimi van der Molen. Van der Molen. Mimi van der Molen. Was headed by Mimi van der Molen. The 1993 Probe update will be headed by Mimi van der Molen. She'd worked on the 1974.